While I was copy pasting houses for the massive development, I started questioning, is this the only way we can provide homes? This question has been bothering me for years and still does. That's why, once again, I went back to school to learn more about alternative housing models. In architecture school, we mainly studied diverse housing typologies and barely anything about approaches to implement them, even though these housing models directly influence typologies. Since this topic was in my mind for years, the summer school ad from Independent School of the City got directly into this target. So I had no other choice than to go back to school and dig into this topic together with tutors and my groupmates and get back this feeling of student life, yeah, even though just for two weeks. With the small difference that now I'm a bit less naive. So what are these models that are currently available for us? I have to mention that I will talk mainly about Dutch context now. So if you have other interesting models in your country, please let me know in the comments and if there would be enough input from you guys, I'll make another video based on your suggestions. So let's start checking the business as usual model and in this case, stakeholders play on the free market and the profit is the end goal. What happens here is basically that landowners hire developers which hire architects and contractors and other subcontractors and also developers get the bank loans. Then architects together with developers take care of negotiation and permission with municipalities. Meanwhile, residents and other interested group can try to object it. Then happens the actual construction which creates a new asset for the owners. Subcontractors get the fee and the owners rent or sell the housing units to reach the final goal – revenue. That's it. But since their final goal is profit, they target higher levels of society, creating supply there. While the biggest, less wealthy groups, the margins barely cover it. This creates competition and prices go up even more. Ugh. As many scholars nowadays would say that housing market shows all characteristics of market failure. What can we do differently here? Hmm. First, let's focus again on who owns the land. I guess after a few of my videos this question is already integrated in your brain. Now we'll talk about Erfpa. I have no clue how would you call it in other countries, so if the description sounds familiar to you, please leave the name of the country in the comments. The model is super simple. There is a landowner, usually a municipality, that turns out the plot for building owner. From time to time they can review the rental price. The building owner can sell it, but municipality should approve the buyer. It is done and no one wants to postpone it, the landowner should buy out the building. In this case, the house owner will reduce the housing price because there is no need to buy the land and the municipality will still have the control over the development. When the market falls, the government tries to take it over and Dutch social housing nowadays is kind of a hybrid of a huge top-down NGO that has to behave as a market player. The main goal is to ensure an adequate supply of affordable, good quality rental homes for low-income households. They are subsidized and have a sectoral guarantees. They also have to reinvest all their profit back into housing. But lately, most of the biggest ones got into speculation and bankrupt scandals. And as a result, we see insane cases when they evict residents and demolish quite okay houses in order to get sustainability renovation funds and cover their debt. Poof, this is just over the top, um, but we are not going to dig into the dirty laundry and move to the hot model. In the 70s there was this housing shortage mainly for young people, students and young couple. This was also the reason why the squatter movement started growing and the municipality used hot projects as in answer to it. There were usually low-rise rental small apartments and later on the housing corporations took over these initiatives. In all these cases we talk about affordable rental homes. In Singapore, meanwhile, they have a housing development board, HDB, that provides homes with 99 years lease. 
There are of course many restrictions and requirements in this model, like ban to sell it in the first year or social credits you need to get it, which is needed to make sure that these homes will go to the people that really need them and won't end up in the free market. Yeah, Singapore is wealthy and tiny country. It's easier for them to do so. Well, now it's time to remind you about the country where I was born. Okay, okay, I was just two when that crazy social experiment was over, so I experienced only result of it. Basically, there were public massive subsidies that would go through factories to build homes for their workers. All housing stock was publicly owned, but you and your family could stay there forever. In Yugoslavia, they wanted to go even further and move towards self-organizations where people will directly own and manage all the assets. We all know that both these countries collapsed. Then the mad wave of uncontrolled privatization and free markets just swallowed up the housing stock. As a result, yes, we don't have slums, but the price we paid for it is the life in this unified, faceless neighborhood with any sense of community. I still have nightmares that it's back, but now in combination with IKEA interiors, the problem here is that government and developers patronize citizens like people can't handle it themselves as they used to do before the 20th century but slowly things changing. International organizations use the empowerment concept to provide homes in global south, that, like the Empower Shack project in South Africa. The community-based project will always face the main issue with the land. The answer to it could be the community land trust. In a community land trust, residents join forces to take care of the future development of the neighborhood into their own hands. It's a non-profit democratic organization consists of residents, members of the broader community and external experts. They finance it via donations, subsidies and community foundations. In the land trust, the land ownership is separate from the building one. All the land is owned by the trust, while buildings are privately bought or rented. Build a house on your own in this dead city, it's almost impossible nowadays. Besides, society moves again from the individual to collective trends. That's why we can see collective housing or CPO emerging. Quite often it's a small group of friends or friends of friends that decide to live together and share some parts of the house like co-working space or laundry. Each of them will own the part of the house. Since they build it not for the profit, the price is lower, but they all struggle to find proper rules for those who want to exit the community. This model also requires intensive time and capacity investments from the residents, and housing corporations could answer these issues. In this case, there is an organization that takes care of all the negotiation, finance and all kind of organization stuff. Future residents become members of this community by getting a share in the project, but they never will be the actual owners of this housing unit. They will rent it from the corporation. Collective, privately organized housing is something that the Dutch banking system doesn't really want to deal with. So these projects have to borrow money from German banks. Another solution to that that the German housing collective came with is to organize the syndicate. In a few words, it's a network of self-sustainable projects that make regular symbolic contribution to the syndicate. This money they use to help the new similar projects to avoid bank loans. Besides, they support each other also with the knowledge sharing. Okay, this is all clear when we talk about permanent houses. But what shall we do with the insane amount of vacant buildings? In 70s, 80s and even 90s, squatters were the answer to it. Apparently, they even prevent Amsterdam city center renewal projects and demolition of historical buildings. But it's not legal anymore, which doesn't mean that they don't exist anymore. Some squatters got lucky and were legalized, which made their life a bit easier. Most of the squatters stay in this highly insecure and hyper-collective environment somewhere around five years. After squatters became illegal, anti-squats came instead of them. Commercial companies took it over and now it's a business. 
They inhabit empty buildings with so-called guardians, with no conflict and no trouble profiles, and take money for rent from them. They can also kick them out with short notice and often impose ridiculous rules on them. Can these models help us to escape the housing crisis? Each of them has its own pros and cons, and nowadays there are more and more others emerging. Like starting the mark, experimenting with the mix of anti-squad and collaborative housing approaches. I'm curious if you have some other alternative models in your country, and I'm looking forward to your comments, and see you next time. Papa. Yeah, I'm